Hey everybody, I love being here with all you fantastic people. I love being here and with that audio, that's always a bonus. And again, thank you for being here. Thank you for being such an amazing community. And a big thank you as well to Sanjay, who gave me the inspiration this morning. He sent me a slide. It was a picture of data out of Afghanistan. And that's what motivated this. And I think it's an important lesson to be told as usual. We're going to touch on a whole bunch of different stuff. And we all know the world needs crypto, but exactly why and what is the alternative and see how they compare together and how we can get adoption out there to the people that really, really need it. Okay, so that's the story today. Let's just jump in. Uh, first of all, well, that doesn't matter at all today. And the story, again, real simple. The core thesis of everything, you know, a huge part of how this channel actually began is about trying to find greater adoption. I know we've been through a horrible time, horrible winter, but remember <laughs> when I first started my, my very first Bitcoin video, I think uh, Bitcoin was at like $4,000. So it's still up from there and that's only two years ago and change. So, but the core thesis is really about adoption and usage of cryptocurrency and how it can bring economic freedom to the world because Crypto solves many of the shortcomings of the world we live in, governments, financial systems, etc., that hinder economic freedom. And I'll prove that to you as well. And also better access to financial services, such as the ability to borrow, lend, etc., transfer money can save billions of people around the world a ton of money and also give them a ton of opportunity. And that is the story today. So let's jump in. So first of all, what is economic freedom? So I was noodling on this and then I found a slide on after, but I always thought of it's important to have property rights, uh, important to be in a country that the government has integrity, important that the government in that country doesn't spend too much money that they don't have. It's important that a person in a country is free to open up a business and start trading in whatever way they want. It's important as well for a movement of labor uh, monetary freedom to choose what you want to use as your money to trade. Again, trade freedom, no restrictions on whatever you want to do, as long as you're not doing really bad stuff, which I won't mention here. And of course, investment freedom, the ability to invest in whatever you want. And right now we're seeing controls coming in all over the place. I'll touch on some of them. One live one today. But then I saw this slide uh, from Coinbase. And this was kind of interesting because it showed where... It wasn't all my, my full list, but it did talk about things like market openness, and it was actually put together by Coinbase. But basically, where crypto helps has a blue tick. So it helps trade freedom. It helps investment freedom. It helps financial freedom. By the way, all these categories came from Wikipedia. So it was good to see. I don't know if Coinbase got it from Wikipedia or Wikipedia got it from Coinbase. Who knows? But then regulatory efficiency, business freedom, labor freedom, monetary freedom, very important, and rule of law, property rights. Again, these are things that are being hampered and constrained in some countries around the world that make it very hard for people to get ahead. And that is the key message today. So let's talk about Jack Maulers. He came on, yeah, I think he was on CNBC, and he mentioned something which kind of fits here. Uh, he said, money that's free to create is only valuable with trust. Fiat money isn't valuable because it requires trusting central banks. And Bitcoin is valuable because it doesn't require trusting anybody. As I say, it's trustless. And he also said creating money can't be free. Even Satoshi had to pay for energy to mine the first Bitcoin. So that was a super, super interesting little thing, just to give us some perspective of where things are. A couple of things here. Again, trustless and nothing is free. Nothing good in life is free. Sometimes people say the best things in life are free. But anyway, that's that perspective. We also know, we've been stressing this for a long time, the Gov coins are coming, the central bank digital currencies. And we also know that the, despite this article from The Economist that said digital currencies that will transform finance, uh, no, nationalized money will probably cause havoc. And let me explain why I believe that is the case. So first of all, Jeff Booth, uh, <laughs> a good friend and a hero out there in the space, is one of the best books ever. Um, you know, the Price of Tomorrow, everybody, if you haven't read it, please read it. Um, not chilling here, just to make sure. But 
uh, I love this quote. It said it took 185 trillion of debt to produce 46 trillion of GDP growth over the last 20 years. So putting that in perspective, let's talk about a little bit of havoc math about how governments are capital allocators. So for every $4 of government spending, they generate $1. The question is, do you want them allocating capital on your behalf or borrowing money on your behalf? That will be a burden for your children and your children's children down, down the line. And I, I was never a fan of politics. I always stayed away. I was never left or right, didn't care, wasn't interested. I My dream was always for politicians to stay out of everything. But what I've witnessed over the last three years, really, has meant I can no longer be silent. So you get videos like this. So for example, there's even a meme out there, which is very funny. If you spend $4 fighting poverty, that only creates $1 of wealth for those in poverty. What's the point? <laughs> and that's the big story here. But before we go into the crypto stuff, I want to share one thing from my old school. And this is the uh, Wharton budget model. And what's scary about this is they estimate that over the next 75 years, things are going to explode. It's math. It's very simple. And the U.S. federal government faces a permanent fiscal imbalance to equate to approximately just over 10% of GDP every year. And under current law, where future federal spending outpaces tax and related receipts, it's just going to grow. And federal government deficit is expected to climb to, if you look at the numbers there, uh, about 236% of GDP by 2050, which, ladies and gentlemen, is only 28 years away. Okay, that's basically nearly double what it is today. But after that, it explodes to over 800% of GDP by the year 2095. That's only 75 years away. Now, what's important is we've got to think about the future generations. And you can calculate everybody, ladies and gentlemen, drop a comment below if you can calculate what two and a half trillion dollars is divided by 300 million. That is the debt per person. That's your homework for today. If you can calculate that, and there's a lot of, lot of zeros, so uh, it's super shocking to think. And I think the population will fall over time, and therefore there'll be even more debt per person in the future. But about 50 trillion um, to about 106.6 trillion will be uh, some of the commitments for the future generation. Half of that will uh, will be in form of taxes. So the future generations will also be taxed a hell of a lot. And then there will be a whole bunch of holes for things like Social Security, Medicare, and all the other government benefits. So the future is not very bright when you look at these types of numbers over the next 75 years. And the question is, what are you going to do about it? So <laughs> that's the other thing. So let's go to crypto. And is it freedom? So what does crypto do? So crypto offers freedom for ordinary people who are unbanked. We've seen that all around the world, especially during calamity type situations. It is also good for those who are barred from financial services for any number of discriminatory reasons. That's the stuff going on in China right now. And crypto also offers freedom for those who want to escape unscrupulous dictators or, you know, I don't need to name any names, but you know who they are. And also freedom for those who cannot allocate capital like governments and those who want to escape central bank digital currencies. They're coming. They're coming fit, fast and furious. Over the next two to three years, I think three quarters of the world will have them in place and people will not be happy. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen happening in my life. And I've seen some crazy stuff. So let's talk about adoption. And in Africa is the world leader in Bitcoin adoption. These are the peer-to-peer -peer exchange share of all cryptocurrency transactions, transaction volume by region. And you can see number one is Sub-Saharan Africa at over just over 6%. Uh, then you have Western Europe at a tiny fraction of that amount. Uh, let me pull this, make this a little larger. What did I just do? Uh, I tried to zoom it in so I can see 0.6% Western Europe. 0.7% for North America, 0.6% for Middle East, Latin America, 1.7%, place like Argentina, Brazil, very popular, uh, and Central and Southern Asia, 3.1%. Some of the key numbers out there around Bitcoin adoption and how much is actually transferred based on everything else. Let's talk about what triggered this whole inspiration from Sanjay. 
and that is the war against freedom or crypto. So over the past week, Afghanistani authorities uh, closed down another 16 unidentified cryptocurrency exchanges in the country's western Herat province after a re another recent ban on crypto trading. And the Afghanistan bank said uh, they acted and arrested all exchangers involved in the business and forced them to close their shops because they want to protect their citizens. Hmm. Or is it something else? So let's look at what happened uh, in August and September 2021. The Taliban took over because somebody handed the keys back. We won't talk about that either. But Afghanistan's on-chain activity spiked in September. It was a big rush to get stuff done to over $160 million, which is a truckload of money for that time. Since then, the on-chain activity is less than 80000 a month. A far cry from over 160 million a month. And that is how much the citizens are receiving before the actual takeover of the Taliban. Obviously, that's not good. But what happens is uh, there are three options for people who want to participate in the crypto world. One, run away. Two, stop. Or three, I won't talk about what the third option is under the Taliban, but it's not pretty. This is the problem. So these people now are prevented from getting ahead, but there will be a solution towards the end we'll talk about as well. So let's talk about crypto growth in the Middle East and Africa, Turkey, Egypt. Um, there are very heavy fluctuations in currency prices out there, and that has coincided with the rapid fiat currency devaluations, uh, strengthening appeal for things like Bitcoin and crypto for preserving wealth, store of value, whatever you want to call it. Turkish lira inflated 84% in the last year, Egyptian pound 14% down, and uh, significant, however, is Egypt's remittance market. The remittance payments account for 8%, 8% of Egypt's GDP. And that is where the country's national bank has already begun a project to build a crypto-based remittance corridor between Egypt and the Emirates, where many Egyptian natives actually work. Now, uh, we could go on and on and talk about this, but the key is adoption is huge and rampant. You can see the delta between July 2020 and June 2021, between and July 2021 and June 2020. Just one year later, the Egyptian adoption is up 221%. Saudi Arabia, 200%, Lebanon, 121%, Morocco, 121%, etc. So this stuff is real. People will find a way to transact using crypto because they need to save a lot of fees. We'll talk more about those later too. Let's talk about the MENA zone. This is the uh, series of countries, Middle East, North Africa. So I think this place like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Arab Emirates, Qatar, Bahrain, Oman, etc. But if you look here, you can see the clear growth uh, favors places like Turkey, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, UAE are the top sponsors. Now, there's many, many reasons for that. Uh, sometimes it's the political regimes in place. Sometimes it's the crazy inflation. Sometimes it's the size of the remittance market, etc. But there is a direct correlation between the two biggest adopters and inflation or currency debasement, whatever you want to call it. You can see uh, the 84% for Turkey and 178% for Lebanon, and people are not happy in those countries by no stretch. But the only safety raft they have, even despite the down market, is Bitcoin. I did talk uh, a week or two ago about the UK, how over the last 90 days, Bitcoin has, has actually helped preserve store of wealth between British pound and Bitcoin. But let's switch gears and talk about economic freedom and how that maps to GDP per capita, which is typically the wealth per person in a country and how much is produced per person in a country. But you can see here, there's a direct correlation between economic freedom and how it's ranked and the amount that people produce. And top of the list off the charts is Luxembourg, then Macau, then Switzerland, then Ireland, then Norway, Singapore, US, Qatar, Denmark. It was all the way down the list. And I won't mention some of the countries at the bottom but they don't have those economic freedoms and therefore they can't produce. But enabling them to produce can increase GDP for both themselves and of course the country. And that's what crypto can bring. If some of these countries, instead of taking the Taliban direction, if they can find a way to embrace crypto, it can be very beneficial. I know El Salvador is going down this path. The, the 
judge is still out on whether it's working or not, but it has definitely helped tourism and it's definitely put the country on the map. So back to payments for a second. This is just from today. Thank you again, Sanjay. This is basically EU has just banned crypto payments from Russia in new sanctions package. Again, I know where they're doing this and I know what they're trying to do. And that's all fair and good, but it does hurt the average person on the ground that's trying to find a way to get out or escape or whatever. It is bad. And this is kind of where the governments come in. And we'll talk more about this piece towards the very end as well. So let's talk about TradFi for a second. They are not happy about this whole move to crypto either. So this is uh, somebody moving $17 million for a dollar and 18 cents. It's actually 17.674 million dollars for basically nothing. And the traditional banks, when they see this type of frictionless payment mechanism, they are very deeply alarmed and they don't like it because that is a huge part of the revenue stream. Look at people who are doing remittances. Sometimes they lose 25 to 30% of their money just by sending it. And if you use crypto, it's basically free. So let's take a little bit further. Let's talk about what Derek Ross thinks of the traditional financial system. He said, the legacy financial system are so screwed. They limit how much money I'm allowed to transfer. It takes five days. They charge me a fee and... <laughs> They just canceled my transfer for some reason. I hate banks. Bitcoin fixes this. So that is a very eloquent way to put the problem and also the challenge for traditional finance systems and banks in the future. Because if the adoption of crypto takes off, there's going to be some hell to pay for these guys. Now, back to CZ from Binance. He was asked, what is the biggest blocker for crypto adoption? And he said, point blank, the wallet because people don't know how to adopt Bitcoin. They don't know how to transact, etc. But if you can simplify the wallet, you can change the game. And this is where this guy comes in. But um, the big plan for the solution for mass adoption of crypto is a wallet integrated in a smartphone, and that can help with global, global economic freedom. And in fact, uh, Anatoly here, he said, what does it look like with 1 billion people using crypto? What do you imagine? He said, it's in this device, in this device you use every day. The phone has to be your hardware wallet. That's something that we always felt. And why the phone? What's special about the phone? Why not just a laptop or the internet? Well, more people have phones than anything else. And also, with a wallet and the phone, it's better, cheaper, faster. It's also fully authenticated because there's a ton of features within a smartphone that are very important. Privacy and Web3 are interrelated. For security to take hold, it has to be on a mobile device, and the secure elements are all on mobile devices, such as fingerprints and retina scans and all that type of stuff, which is becoming key and critical. And that will give the users much more confidence with transacting in crypto going forward. Let's talk about Web3 for a second. I know people hate the term Web3. I don't like it much myself. So I call it the tokenization of everything. That's what I called it early last year. And here, this cool little graphic explains it. So we have the history of the web. Uh, the, it was originally the information economy, web one, where you read and you do it on computers. And then it became the platform economy, players like Facebook, YouTube, um, etc. Wikipedia. You could do it sometimes on a phone, sometimes on a computer, and that's it. And then web three is really the token economy, or as I refer to the tokenization of everything. And all of that will happen on mobile as we go forward. And you can read, write, and execute. Execute transactions, move money around, do payments, set up commerce, pay people, charge people, all that type of stuff will all be native on the phone. And that's why the phone is the future. Now, there's a lot of scary stuff for governments. There's a lot of scary stuff for traditional finance, and they're all going to fight it. But as we've seen, this is what happens when you try to ban Bitcoin. It's hard. Not saying it's impossible. It's hard. We just saw the European Union banning payments out of Russia on crypto ways. So we'll see. But this, again, here is the chance people in, say, economies that have less economic freedom. I am hoping the day will come where the phone will grant them freedom. And if they block internet, then some of the things like Starlink from Elon Musk can give them freedom to access internet with their phone. And as the prices of devices and smartphones come down, 
the adoption will go up and hopefully we'll get to that billion users in crypto and that will bring a lot of economic freedom and financial freedom to a lot of people. That's the goal. That's the hope. Thank you everybody for today and a big thank you to moderators in the chat and everybody in the chat and Java and oh, you guys are crazy. I'm uh, Anyway, thank you so much. Uh, again, as I wrote in the comment, Java, we'll reach out to you as well. Finding your special wish for this weekend. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good night, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow is Friday. That's DCA on Rob's channel. So expect that sometime early Pacific time, 11 a.m. Pacific normally. Thanks all. Have a good night.